in any dimension of life, there are authorities. People who have the privilege, the power, the permission to set the rules, to determine the judgments and the verdicts. But there is one who has authority that surpasses all other authorities. In Matthew chapter 28, verse 18, Jesus said this, All authority is given unto me in heaven and in earth. All authority is given unto me. That is an amazing claim to privilege. That is an amazing claim to power, to permission, to right. And Jesus demonstrated that very well in His ministry. For example, when He had concluded the Sermon on the Mount, it says in Matthew chapter 7, verse 28, the people were astonished at His doctrine, for He taught them as one having authority. You see, He taught with authority. In their particular culture, that meant he quoted nobody. He footnoted nothing. He didn't say he'd gotten this truth from some eminent rabbi. He didn't say that this was an exposition of some commentary written by some respected person of another time. He just spoke with authority. In chapter 9 of Matthew... He healed a paralyzed man and forgave his sin. And the multitude saw it and marveled and glorified God who had given such authority unto men. He had authority to say whatever he wanted to say and make it binding on men. He had authority to heal, authority over disease. He had authority to forgive sin. Remarkable. Go to Proverbs seventeen fifteen. Now look what it says. He who justifies the wicked and he who condemns the righteous, both of them alike are an abomination to the Lord. Now let's just consider this one phrase. He who justifies the wicked is an abomination to the Lord. Now we got a big problem. Most of the songs we sing today are going to be about God justifying the wicked. That's what we sing about all the time. Man, God justified us. Even though we were sinners, God declared us to be right. That's what justification means. God declared you to be right before Him. And you praise God for that. But there's a big problem here. Do you see what it is? God says that anyone who declares the wicked to be right, when they are not right, they are an abomination before Him. So if God declared you to be right when you were not right, it's an abomination. He has made Himself an abomination. If God forgives the wicked, He Himself becomes an abomination. In the same way that if a judge forgives a murderer and lets him go, he's no longer a just judge. It's, it's so amazing to me how so many people I speak at university as students are just furious because I say that God throws men in hell. They're furious when I say that. But you know what bothers heaven? Heaven has a problem with what God has done. Heaven's problem is this. If God is a just God, He cannot forgive. He must punish the wicked. That is the... That is the the thing of the whole Bible. Have you ever wondered why God's got all these animals dying in the Old Testament? It's a symbol and a type. But the whole point is, if the sinner sins, he must die. He must die. And if God justifies someone who is wicked, if He declares a wicked person to be innocent, then God is an abomination. God has become wicked. Now we're beginning to see why it was necessary for God, the Son, to die. God cannot simply forgive. The law, the righteous law, demands that the sinner die. Demands it. You just can't push that away. 
You just can't say, okay, we're going well, to let them slide this time. If God does that, He is unjust, He is wrong, He is sinful, He becomes just like the devil, and the devil's accusations against Him now are correct. Do you see the problem? Now, the only way that God can forgive sinful men is if God who made the law and God who demands satisfaction, if He Himself comes down and pays the penalty. That's why the doctrine of the Jehovah Witnesses is so blasphemous. Look at what they're saying. They're saying that when the world fell, God created, created an innocent being, the Son, created Him, and then took this innocent being, independent from God, and put Him on a cross to die to fix the problem. See, that's not what happened. The Son of God is not a created being. He is God. You see, the only way the law of God can be satisfied is by God. And you can use that against the Jehovah Witness. If Jesus is not God, then everybody's going to hell because what was done on that cross is not enough. God made the law. God has to satisfy it. The Apostle Paul wants to help us to understand who Jesus is. And I want you to look in your Bible to Colossians chapter 1. Among all of the passages of Scripture that we might have looked at to see the reality of the child who was God, none is more grand than this one in the first chapter of Colossians. I want to read to you starting in verse 15. Listen to what the Bible says about Jesus Christ. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by Him all things were created, both in the heavens and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things have been created by Him and for Him, and He is before all things, and in Him all things hold together. He is also head of the body of the church, and He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that He Himself might come to have first place in everything, for it was the Father's good pleasure for all the fullness to dwell in Him. Every one of those statements that is made from verse 15 through verse 19 is absolutely exclusive. They are true of Him and nobody else. And the sum of them all is at the end of verse 18 where it says that He is to have the first place in everything. No one else is the image of the invisible God. No one else can be the firstborn of all creation. No one else can be the creator of things in heaven and earth, visible and invisible. No one else sits over the thrones and dominions and rulers and authorities. No one else is before all things and held, and holds all things together. No one else is the head of the body, the church, the beginning, the firstborn. No one else has all the fullness dwelling in Him to the pleasure of the Father. Those are all absolutely exclusive statements. And what they tell us is that Jesus Christ is utterly unique. There is no one like Him. He is beyond everyone else. He is infinitely beyond everyone else. And if we're going to slight somebody at His, at his birthday, better it be a man than the God-man. The humble birth of Jesus Christ that we read about a little while ago from Luke's gospel in the manger, which is a feed trough in a stable, the humble garment that wrapped his little body was never intended to be a quiet facade to hide the reality that God was being born. Although the world has tried to make it that, it was really a demonstration of condescension, servanthood, humiliation. Frankly, those people who have tried to find in the accoutrements of Christmas a simplicity and a humility that covers up reality have a hard time explaining how an event so humble could be the most widely known event on the face of the earth.